All right, people, we are making progress here. We've done a bunch of lectures about core machine learning algorithms like logistic regression, but I also look at some of the feature selection, feature engineering stuff as that type of core. We've been going through a bunch of stuff about how to become a professional machine learning practitioner. And that's a lot of the measurement stuff, thinking about how to go from these algorithms to a working model. In this lecture, we're going to start to introduce the third major topic of that of the course, and that is how do you take this and put it into a working system? And so in this lecture, we're going to go through uh, just an overview of what some of the issues are. Um, later in the course, we'll go through specific design patterns in a moderate to heavy amount of detail, and we'll explore some of the topics that I introduce in this lecture um, more. We'll talk about things like how do you combine machine learning with user interfaces, how do you set the goals for a machine learning system, all of those sorts of things that um, you need if you actually want to ship machine learning into users' hands at scale. But for now, let's start with this, implementing with machine learning, a bit of an overview. So let's say you want to create some software to help people know when to laugh. You want to call it Laugh Finder. And what Laugh Finder does is that it's a little plugin to a web browser. And when a user browses to a page, the plugin will scan the page and it will tell the user if it's funny or not. So the user can laugh. They don't even need to think about it. They don't need to read the page. They're just like, I'm on a funny page. It's time to laugh. Ha 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 ha. And conversely, they might, uh, the user wouldn't accidentally laugh on a page that's not funny. So this is a potentially quite important piece of software. Um, and the way it might surface itself is something like this. So really the whole user experience about Laugh Finder is does a little laughy face pop up there or does it not? And maybe a little bit of interaction with this laughy face. The first place you might start, you know, sort of pre-machine learning would be something along these lines. You might create a browser plugin um, and that browser plugin might have a list of funny words. Maybe you find the top thousand funny words. Like whenever, like the only reason that word is ever used is it's like the punchline of a joke. So there you go. There's your funny words, fugit, whatever that means. Then every time you go to a page, you get the page context. And this is not like real code. This is sort of sloppy pseudo code to just say, hey, you got to like say, I'm at a page, give me the page. Um, and from that, you're able to browse and get the words and all the other things that you might need to have to turn a particular web page into a feature vector when we get to the machine learning part. But for now, all you need to do is scan the words on the page looking for any word on your funny list. And if you find one, you set is funny to true. And then when you're done with the scan, you just hop into this update user experience magical function, which will do the right thing there and let the user know, hey, it's time to start laughing, buddy. Let's go. Okay, well, that's a traditional approach to this. If you were going to do it with machine learning, now we've seen all the elements of this and I've, I've kind of been introducing these concepts to some degree. So hopefully this is a bit of a review, but um, hopefully also you will be looking at these things with a different mental context and it might make more connections into what you do on a daily basis to look at it this way. So if you are writing this plugin with a machine learning approach, instead of having a list of words, you'd have a model. So you'd say model load from some data file location or resource or however they do things these days. Uh, then every time a page gets loaded, you have to do that same thing of getting the application context, the same, the same, but now you call featureize. And here's a little just sloppy um, uh, rendition of what we talked about in the feature selection course. And this is the feature selection parameters uh, that'd be encoded in the model somehow. And but by combining those feature selection parameters with the words that occur on the page, you can produce an X vector. Then you can call model predict just like we were doing, you know, with, with that vector and it'll return a prediction. Then you can take that prediction and take the threshold that's encoded into your model. And if the prediction is greater than the threshold is funny as true. And then you update the user experience just like before. Oh okay, yeah, very similar to what we had, just a few lines are different. How hard is this machine learning thing after all? Right, so a few more details is, here's an example of what the file format might be. Um, you could encode the threshold, you could encode the number of words or features in the model, and I guess this is a example of a linear model logistic regression. Then you would include all the, uh, the words along with their weights, although word zero 
might be special case because remember W0 is a special case thing. And there you go, that's the file. You have all the words you need to do this featureized step written right in there. And you have the threshold, you have everything you need, there's your encoding. And you know, then that gives you all the information you need to do this featureized thing like we said. Um, and then you have to call into the inference engine. Now what's an inference engine? The, the inference engine is the code that executes your model on the feature vector. Okay. I mean, we've written that code by now. If you're doing your assignments and you should be doing your assignments, don't wait until the end. You'll be so sad because you're going to wait till the end. You're going to code it. It won't take you long to code it, but then doing all the modeling runs you need to produce the answers so you can get credit is going to take a long time and it might crash once. It might crash twice. Don't put it off till the end. But the point that I was trying to make before I got distracted is that that same code will need to somehow live in this plugin. And it might be a slightly different version of the code because you, you just need like the predict part. You don't need all the, um, the uh, gradient descent stuff, but maybe you want it, but maybe you need to actually write it in a different programming language to make it able to run in the browser. So there's some complexity hidden there. And then um, the threshold is just encoded in the model. And you might wanna, like we said, in the last lecture, the lecture before, the lecture before I lose track of this, you might want to update that on a more regular basis to avoid drift. So anyway, now I've, I've made this point briefly that the model in the runtime is different from what you need to do in the intelligence creation environment. And so far in this course, we've been talking like all of your experiments, all of your assignments are essentially in the intelligence creation environment. And what you spit out from there is that encoded model file, which somebody off in the ether is going to pick up and use in an application. And just to draw some connections, which may or may not be obvious, when you try to start doing machine learning, the template code that I provided for you or, or your code, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to have to load the raw data that it has available for training, validation, and testing. And in this case, I say this load page from log, which is a sloppy way of saying that that data probably originated in a log file, something that you know the runtime did that push data up into a log so that you would have it available to make your models better with. Or it could have come from somewhere else. And we'll see there's different um, design patterns for working with machine learning that include where you get your data from. Another possibility is that you paid people to go off and find a bunch of um, funny pages and unfunny pages and to create some data set. But the point is that whatever they did, however they brought in that data, however you logged it or read it from the log, you need to be able to exactly match at intelligence creation time what's going to be happening for you at runtime. So if there's some information that you have available at runtime that you haven't gotten to your intelligence creation environment, maybe you were unable to log it, it was too expensive, you forgot, maybe there was a bug in the code that's logging it, so now things are out of sync, whatever that is, those types of problems will reduce your ability to use machine learning by, you know, once something's out of sync, you can't do the learning, so you're sort of stuck. Um, then in the intelligence creation environment, of course, you have to split the data into train, test, and validate. Uh, then you're going to run feature selection, and, and we've seen the pattern for that where it's a hyperparameter loop search, but we're just sloppifying it here a little bit. Then you're going to featureize your whole training set. And now here's another place where um, that's what you're doing in the intelligence creation environment, but you're also going to need to do that at runtime. And if that code gets somehow out of sync, you're going to be very, very sad. I brought this up briefly, I think, in a previous lecture, but what's going to happen when that code gets out of sync? A couple things could happen. One is that um, you, for example, um, certain features are a little bit corrupted so that they don't quite have the same value at runtime that they have in intelligence creation time. That's maybe sort of OK in that the program will still run, but the accuracy at runtime will just be a little bit less than the accuracy was at intelligence creation time. I don't know. Another um, probably better problem in some ways is that something's really messed up where uh, you just produce like different numbers of features or something along those lines and maybe maybe you're lucky enough to get something to crash. <laughs> Another thing, I mean, I've, I've been bit by this is that you just have your indexes off by one. Somehow, you know, the feature creation isn't just dealing with words. There's a couple different types of features and they get stuck together. And somehow in that process, the indexes get off by one. And then our runtime accuracy, and this was when I was working on the Xbox One, our runtime accuracy was just off. I mean, it was sort of okay, but it wasn't good. 
And it took us forever to realize that, oh, it's just not the model training. It's not in the inference code. It's oh, this oh, off by one error in the feature creation. So common problem, keeping these things in sync, um, invest time, make sure that you have uh, automated the ability to create this type of mistake out of your life, right? If, if that's possible with the systems that you're working with. Um, then we're gonna do the model training and again, the whole loop sweep thing, which I'm glossing over a little bit here. And um, once you have the model trained, you also need to produce the threshold that achieves the operating point that you need to use in practice and you know, use some validation data or a separate holdout set. Again, all of this is a little bit just sloppy to illustrate what's actually happening. And finally, you need to encode all of this stuff into the file that you're gonna end up reading over there. So similar, different, and a couple of places where you can very easily make mistakes that will be impossible to find and waste a lot of your life force. Look out for those. Then of course you have to deploy it. Deploying is intelligence management. And now on the next slide, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what intelligence management might mean. All right, intelligence management. And intelligence management is a process of taking the models that you create and getting them to where they need to be. And sure, you can do a copy, you can just do a copy manually, but um, when you're building machine learning at scale, a manual copy is just not gonna cut it. it. You have to do it too frequently. There's too many ways to make mistakes. You're not allowed to just copy code out without flighting it on some users or, or getting some verification that it's working in practice. So intelligence management is kind of the, uh, the name for all the stuff that you need to do in that phase of the process. And, uh, you know, so you have your intelligence creation environment. Periodically, you're creating a new model because if you're not dealing with a large open-ended time-changing problem where you're trying to push accuracy, make it better and better and better, maybe machine learning isn't the right thing. So occasionally you're gonna build new models. Those new models are gonna get, um, and this is a conceptual thing. This is like a pattern that I've seen used again and again. This isn't like, I'm not trying to say a specific set of tools or things that you must do. This is just like, conceptually, your model is going to get ingested into the intelligence management system that's going to have to figure out, hey, is this actually good? And you say, wait a second, I already had a test set, I already, but good can mean a lot of other things. It can mean um, runs in the run, the amount of runtime that we need it to run in, doesn't crash, um, you know, double check that the operating points are holding up in practice, flight it to some users and make sure that it doesn't completely mess up their experiences. So there's a lot more that you can do outside of intelligence creation. And that sort of happens in this intelligence management conceptual phase of the process. Then once you verify the intelligence, you have to decide, okay, it's, it's good enough. I'm going to deploy it and roll it out to everybody. And then you actually have to manage that. And, you know, sure, you can just take the file and copy it to the runtime, whether that's like the, uh, tablet that it's running on, the server where the intelligence is being hosted, your end user's computer. Um, one option is that you can take the new model, compile it into a new version of the app and then push it. Like this is sort of the app store model. I don't know why, like the apps that I use on, like every time I pick up my iPhone, there's 24 apps that need updates. Come on guys, you don't need to like, can you be a little bit like, mm? anyway, I'm sure that's not, that's not what's going on, but the point is that compiling and pushing an app is an expensive way to update your machine learning model. There are better things you can do, obviously. Um, another is that you could host a model in some sort of update service and change the client to check the update service periodically and pull down a new model if it's authorized to have that particular version of the model. For example, is it in the, is it in the flight group? Is it the model being rolled out in some controlled fashion? Is the model being pushed out to everyone? Is it being pushed to geographic regions? All of these types of things are criteria that you might use when deciding on the client, you know, do I go get this model now? And so every time the app starts, you can, you can have this update model kind of conceptual code that does all of this thought process and negotiates with the server, figures out, do I have the bandwidth to download the model, yada, 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 and then reloads it. And, you know, check for the new model, download and save. And then there's this notion of potentially hiding latency or dealing with problems. For example, you know, can you use the previous version of the model while you wait for the new version of the model to download? Or do you somehow need to pause the app? Maybe um, the reason that you're pushing the new model is because the other one was dangerously broken. So there may be additional layers of communication and synchronization between these two systems. 
All right, so now you've pushed the model, you've taken it from intelligence creation, you've got everything lined up so you can run it in the runtime without breaking stuff. You've done intelligence management to get it there. Now it's out on your customer's machines and you're gonna wanna know, is this thing working at all? All right, maybe you don't wanna know, maybe you just wanna go la, 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 but if you're a professional machine learning person, you wanna like know that, hey, it's doing what it was supposed to do. Um, I can see where it's making mistakes. I sort of understand why it's making those mistakes. I have a plan for if I want to go after those mistakes or not, the operating points being effective, all of that stuff. So, you know, you could say, okay, standard monitoring stuff. You guys are all engineers. You know how to do that. But um, a couple things that you might think about in machine learning. One is that verifying the model is running as expected. Every so often, when you process a page and get the prediction, you have a very low sampling rate, for example, and then you log to the server the page, the um, features that your code on the client created for that page, and the version of the model that was running. Now you have everything that you would need to do to take this back into the intelligence creation environment or some version of it and run your intelligence creation code on that page, um, get the features that you produce, run that version of the model on those features that you produced in your environment and make sure you're getting the same Y that the client's getting. Now, I have this, this notion of very low sampling rate. And of course, sampling, um, knowing what data you need to make your system better is much more complicated than this. I mean, it is always nice when doing this type of system, if you can um, have a completely unbiased sample at a very low rate of everything that's going on, that's a very useful thing, helps you find generic problems. But you also might want to have focused sampling on specific things that you think might be causing you problems. Um, like particular domains that you you find are more important or less important to know what's going on, particular types of users, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then the next thing that you want to do is not just verify that the model is running as expected, but verify that the model's quality is good. Um, that is, one way you could do that is take the data that you've logged to your server, look at those pages and hand label them to make sure that um, when a human looks at the page, they agree with the why that you're predicting. Not just that you're producing the right features, but that the labels that you're getting, um, the accuracy that you're seeing in the wild is similar to what you expected it to be in the intelligence creation environment. And that is that your generalization of your model is within the confidence bounds that you calculated before you push the model out to your customers. So that's great. You can hand label things if you're able to log data and often you aren't so you might have other approaches one is that you would allow your users to tell you things explicitly in the ux and that is they could come to interact with the smiley face and say man you really got this particular page wrong and there you could have an interaction with the user and collect uh, what you need to take that feedback and make it actionable so that you can make the system better i mean a lot of times your users will say like look i want you to respect me and not just like suck all my data up, but here's a place where I want to make the system better so the next person doesn't have to laugh at this page that I don't think is funny. So users might share information with you. And, and something like this could be like every time a user clicks one of these not funny or funny reports, you can get the page, you can featureize it on the client so you know exactly what your client code is doing, and you can log it to the server. And in this, in this instance, you include the user report in what you log so that you're able to say, well, you know, our model predicted this, the user logged that. Um, lots of interesting cases and combinations of things that you can do there. Now, this is fantastic. You can like add this data to the training set. Your users are creating your training data for you. It's cheaper, it's better, everything is beautiful. Okay, this is all perfect. 10 years ago, this would have worked perfectly. Can anyone see a problem? Jeopardy music, what's the problem? What's the problem? What's the problem? Here is the click. Here's the problem. Privacy. Right, like we need to make sure that we use our da users' data in ways that they would want it to be used, number one. And we use our users' data in ways that don't expose them to any problems that they didn't think about or we hadn't thought about ahead of time. So that includes like, um, security problem, you know, hacking, espionage, insider risks, law, legal, but like all sorts of things. Um, then there's like governments are creating laws about how you can handle users data and where you can move it and how long you can and when the and uh, <laughs> it's a sad time 
I would say in machine learning, it's hard to draw the balance between between the potential you have with these great tools to create better things for people's lives and this issue which some people care a heck of a lot about and some people are like, yeah, I know, I'm using the system, make it better. What do I care? Use the data, right? And so, um, and I'd say, uh, you know, just to be fair, my current employer, my previous employer, all the big companies have this issue and I think they're all taking it very seriously and they're all working hard to do the right thing. That's all I'm going to say. Um, but if you're doing uh, machine learning professionally at any sort of a big company at all, you're going to have to deal with user privacy and how to deal with users' data. And it's going to take a great amount of your time. The next thing I want to talk about is design patterns for machine learning. And this is like, where in your system are you going to put the machine learning? Um, what choices do you need to make when you're putting it there to make sure that the system is supporting the machine learning and the machine learning has a chance to shine and achieve its goal? Um, and we're going to go through these issues more and more as the course goes on. Uh, we're going to have probably four, five, six lectures on various types of these topics, including some uh, design patterns where I talk through a fictionalized machine learning system that I may or may not have worked on and all the issues and scenarios and stuff we bumped into. But just to give a flavor of what that could mean, let's talk about the part of the system of where do you get the training data. And now here are two approaches. Oh, I'm never going to get that right. Two approaches, a closed loop approach to getting training data and the corpus based, corpus centric approach to getting training data. And, you know, they are they all use the same machine learning algorithms, everything. It's just what's the architecture around them? And they can have very different implications for the types of systems you can build, how much those systems are going to cost to build, how quickly you can react to things that change. Um, the corpus centric pattern is based on creating a data collection process. So you might send people off into the world, have them go find funny pages for you, bring those pages back, um, capture those pages so you're not really dealing with user data at this point, you're dealing with data that someone you paid went off and pulled back in for you. Um, and then you might have a separate process where other people sit around and look at all those web pages and hand label them and produce the whys by looking at the data. Now, this corpus can be quite valuable uh, and it's a type of thing that you could use across multiple machine learning based systems if you collect it right and you annotate it correctly. It can also be very expensive. You can, you can look at spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars to produce the data you need to make one working system when you're attacking a really hard, important problem. Anyway, that, that data goes into the training system and la di da di da. The other approach of closed loop is that you want your users to produce the training data for you as they're using the system. And they can do that through explicit feedback, like we saw in the previous slide where they click, this is funny, this is not funny. They can also do it through implicit feedback. That is, they use the system as you intended them to use it, and by the outcome that they got as they work through your system, you're able to see, oh, the true label was actually blah. Often this will happen like in the case of like, okay, the user is trying to buy a product. You'd say, well, have I shown them a product that they like is the why the why is like one, they would like this product. Well, when they buy the product, that's a pretty good implicit signal that they did like that product. It's not perfect, but sometimes machine learning labels and stuff don't need to be perfect. You just need to be heading in the right direction. Another um, great way to get implicit uh, labels is by waiting. Often at a particular moment, you may not know whether a label is going to be yes or no, good or bad, whatever it is. But if you wait a half hour, you can look back and examine the state of the system and examine how the user interacted after that and be like, yeah, yeah, no, actually, that turned out the way we thought or that turned out the opposite to the way we thought. So here's uh, some other examples of explicit and implicit, like <laughs> even a laugh out loud laugh detection. Maybe you can have audio detectors in your, right? I mean, that's silly, but you know. You can be creative. The point is you can be creative. So one of the disadvantages of the corpus centric system is that it can be very, very, very expensive. I mentioned hundred thousands of dollars. I mean, it's not, that wouldn't surprise me at all if you spend that money. You could have, like, imagine you have to get a hundred thousand or a million entities hand labeled and those hand labels need to be accurate. So you probably need to get multiple people to look at them to make sure you're not, you're not making mistakes. So that can be extremely expensive. Um, and so 
that's an advantage for the closed loop is that in a closed loop system, your users are producing the data from you for you. And so they can, you know, as your usage increases, the amount of data you collect increases. And I like to call this the virtuous cycle, where as more users use your system, the quality gets better and that better quality hopefully will attract more users to come and use your system. But, you know, it can be really tricky to get implicit and explicit feedback in a way that you can interpret and you can use cleanly in machine learning. Often getting um, useful training labels out of a closed loop involves you having the ability to completely adapt the user experience. And sometimes you'll craft a user experience, not from like what a UX person says would be the best thing for a user to see, but you'd also incorporate the fact that what your learning algorithm is gonna need to see on the back end to make the system better. So there's some interesting discussions that you can have kind of in the gaps there. Now, those are two design patterns. Um, we're certainly gonna talk a lot more about this. I may not have a lecture about the closed loop one, even though it's the one that I, I used the most. And then here's three other design patterns or approaches to structuring machine learning that are big and important enough um, and have strong implications about where and how you use machine learning that we're gonna talk about and we're gonna have yeah, this one for sure, this one for sure, this one for sure, we're gonna go through actual case studies. This one will, um, I think we'll have some lectures about the underlying technology. I don't know if there's a, oh, I might. I think we may have a guest speaker who might come in and do a case study about that, or he may choose to talk about, about something else, but I'll let you know if that gets locked in, I'm pretty excited. All right, now we've gone through a bunch of phases, like how do you line up the intelligence creation and the runtime? How do you monitor things? How do you do the intelligence management? Some design patterns for where and how to get data and where to put it in the system. Um, the final piece that we're gonna talk about in this lecture is orchestration. And I talk when I think of orchestration, it's like we've built this gigantic machine with all these machine learning algorithms and models and logging and telemetry and intelligence creation and blah, 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 blah. That's awesome, but now somebody needs to take these systems and shepherd them in the world and make sure that they're achieving their goals over time. One analogy uh, a person I worked with for a long time used to use is like, um, as the engineering team, we would build a race car and it'd be an awesome race car. We'd have all the dials and knobs and gear ratios and all that stuff figured out. But then somebody needs to get in that race car, get on the track and win. And that's what orchestration is. I personally, when I first thought of this concept, I started calling it like ML ops, machine learning operations. Um, machine learning people didn't like that. So orchestration, because they're like the, the conductors, they're orchestrating the whole system, that's cooler. But this is a pattern that you, you see regularly and uh, it's not always done by specific skilled individuals just with this task. It's not always done by the machine learning scientists. Sometimes it's done by engineers. Sometimes it's done by groups of people who have, um, you know, like complementary skills, including some UX skills and some customer empathy, like maybe a program manager. But here's some examples of why, you know, not just controlling like the machine learning, like when do I push a new model? How do I push a new model? How do I update things over time? But, you know, like some more kind of critical needs that you might need to, <laughs> need that you might need, critical things that you might need to address as you're running a big machine learning based system, sometimes you're going to have a web page that has some super not funny things on it, like super hyper not funny. And I'll tell you in 2020, there's a lot of things that aren't funny, a lot. And if you have a web page that is not funny and your system is like putting the laughing face up there, that's a problem. We could put your um, business at risk. And so you need something to do to deal with that. Another, you know, you have the flip side of the coin is that there may be a very important comedy site. And for whatever reason, your machine learning does not like that comedy site. Everything on that site is not funny. The comedians who work there are like getting less, fewer followers on Instagram. They're losing all their revenue. They're getting mad. They're calling you. They're threatening to sue. Not great. Um, another thing that you could have is that, you know, they're just like jerks in the world, right? Like some jerk will have nothing to do and they'll come along and be like, ah, ha, ha, these guys think they're so funny. And they report everything in the universe is not funny. Uh, just because they have nothing else to do. They write a program to report things is not funny. Uh, so the orchestration task would be like, well, how do we create a system that has the right knobs and dials that we could address these sorts of problems in a timely fashion, in a sustainable way, that's not going to create a lot of debt, that as things change again and you know new types of problems show up, new things become not funny, et cetera, et cetera. 
So one, one of these, you know, this bad false positive case, one thing you could do is have like a blocked words and say, any page that has these particular words on it is not funny. I swear it's not funny. Um, so that's something that a person might want to maintain. Another thing for the bad false positive is you could have a, a safe list of pages that are always funny. You know, no matter what the model says, you're going to say that this thing is funny. Um, these types of heuristics can be nice tools. You might say like, hey, why don't we just hire 10 people and kind of chase these sorts of problems until they disappear? Eh, I don't know. You know, um, it can be a critical business enabler for dealing with high cost problems. It can also turn your system into brittle spaghetti gibberish intelligence that you can never modify again. So if you are using these types of techniques and you probably need to, you need some way to monitor what's on your block list and safe list and to know like, well, which entries on the block list are performing valuable services today. You know, we assume at the time they were put on the list, they were doing something valuable, but the world changes. These things might atrophy over time. Which ones are like no longer helpful? Which ones are explicitly harmful? And then you might also need some process that, hey, you know what, I just did update the model. Now there's all this stuff on the block list and safe list that are kind of interfering and fighting with what the model itself is trying to do. So you might want to have some way of expiring these things or, you know, managing them in careful ways. And one of the things I worked on was the anti-phishing filter in a major web browser. And you could see how at that scale, there's a lot at risk. Like for example, if the filter starts calling um, a major bank as a phishing site. Okay. So there you go. There's more reasons to do orchestration. You want to improve quality every day by doing feature engineering, training new models, trying different parameter searches, et cetera, et cetera. You may need to be treading water to, you know, swimming to stay stable. As the concept changes, you may need to be doing a whole bunch of work just to not have your quality erode. Um, the costs change in that users say different mistakes are more or less irritating to them or also um, logging costs more over time or servers cost less over time and you can make different decisions about where you want to put your models and how much data you want to collect to monitor them and to and to get the information you need to make them better um, you might get new users or lose old users and um, all sorts of things that are going to be wonky in your system that somebody who cares about the quality day in and day out um, having them around can really help make your system better overall all right, so that's what I wanted to tell you about implementing with machine learning. We'll just do a little summary um, of the major components and the types of decisions that you need to make to implement machine learning in a real system. The first is that you need some intelligence creation environment that can do all the training stuff we need, create the training examples, has all the computation and data, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The next thing is the intelligence management, which will take the model out of the creation environment and get it to the runtime where it needs to execute in practice. And we talked through a lot of the issues that are involved in intelligence management, like making sure the quality is correct, controlling who it goes to and when, um, having communication with the client if it needs to give it special signals like do this now or do this later. Um, then you have the intelligence runtime, which needs to mirror the intelligence creation environment and show the user what the user, I mean, that's the reason that we're here is to get the intelligence runtime producing better things for users' lives. Then you have all this monitoring stuff you need to do, and I've summarized it here as telemetry, and that is making sure the model is doing the same thing in the runtime that it was doing in the creation environment, verifying that the answers it's giving are actually correct, dealing with closing the loop if you're able to go that way, but also allowing the orchestrators to focus their attention on specific places where there may be problems to get the data they need to debug if the system is working, why or why not. Um, and finally, there's the intelligence orchestration, the race car drivers who get in this amazing machine, take it onto the track and win. All right. See you next time.